Thank you, Dr. Mechanism design challenge. Thanks, Don. And thanks for having me. Uh, it's always hard to follow a good act, so I'm going <laughs> to do the best I can and, and be about neuroeconomics uh, and how that how that affects mechanism design. And you may think, what the hell is that? But we'll, I'll get you there. And then the second part will be on repeated play, adaptive behavior, and adaptive design in the midst of adaptive behavior. Uh, um, so let me get going. Uh, I wasn't sure who knew what uh, about mechanism design, so I thought I'd walk you through some of the standard words and the language uh, that's been developed uh, since Leo started us off on this uh, trip a long time ago. And I'm ignoring a lot of stuff here, but I'm just trying to get some basic ideas out. So the framework we work in tends to be we have an a set of env uh, uh, sort of a class of environments. Now, what's an environment? Bunch of individuals, uh, outcomes that those that, that the outcomes can be individually allocated goods, or it can be some public decision. It can be a variety of things. Uh, feasible outcomes. There's some subset that should be a subset of Z. I changed notation halfway through. Uh, so there's a set of these that are possible, and, and then there are some preferences. Individuals have preferences uh, about Z. Uh, and theta i is a parameter in these preferences. It's just indicate that different people can have different preferences. Sometimes you th people think of this as the information i has. Uh, this can, uh, there are a number of ways of interpreting theta i. And for now, I'm allowing your preferences only to depend on your own type. This is a private value kind of case. And, uh, in the, and, and I'm so I'm assuming that utility doesn't depend on other people's types. Uh, I had a section where I didn't do that, but I took it out because it was getting way long. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, and the idea of mechanism design is that you've got these individuals with all this information in order to make good decisions. And as we saw earlier, the question of what is good is still up for grabs, but in order to make some kind of decisions, and I'll get to what I mean by that in a minute, you need to collect this information. This information needs to be gathered up and uh, and you need to do the calculation. The way we do that is a game form, a mechanism. It's in, in my language, I'll just use a game form. In uh, Leo's original language, it was an iterative process. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to that later. But for now, it's a one shot. It's a game. It can be an extensive game, but it's a game form where individuals are given strategies. They do things. And then as a result of these, behave these strategies, an outcome occurs. And uh, they presumably, what they do, what strategies they pick, depends on what behavior they follow. And mechanism design tends to be somewhat agnostic about that. We have theorems about diamond strategies, Nash equilibrium, Bayes equilibrium, and a variety of other things. So we kind of work our way through the implications of different kinds of behavior. But behavior, in my language, is a, is a joint choice of a strategy, equilibrium usually, when you're confronted by the mechanism in an environment. So the, when, you're, when, when this environment exists and the individuals in the environment are confronted with that mechanism, they pick that strategy out. And so given that behavior, given the environments, given the mechanism, we can talk about the performance of a mechanism in an environment for a given behavior, which is just the, uh, the compound behavior. This is the equal. You, you, that's the environment, that's the behavior they pick, this is the outcome that results from that behavior. And so P of, P of theta is an outcome. And so by, by changing the mechanism, we can change the outcome, maybe. And so there are a couple of simple questions we can ask. One is, suppose I have a desired performance. I, I don't, I'm not gonna say where it comes from, I just, there's a targeted performance. For each environment, I want the certain outcome to occur. And then I can ask, is there a mech, given the behavior, sort of given the behavior that I'm confronted with, if I take the behavior as given, can I find a mechanism that'll produce that performance? So if you want to produce efficient allocations and people are going to follow dominated, dominant strategies, can I find a mechanism which, such that do, it has dominant strategies and, they, and the equilibrium produces what I want to produce? That's the kind of question. That's a kind of an, they call that implementation. 
and I'm being loose about some of this. There's, there's, there's issues about whether they're multiple equilibria, whether they're singles. There's a whole variety of stuff that I'm kind of sweeping under the rug here just to kind of get the main ideas out. And then what I think of as second best mechanism design, and sort of that comes about by saying, well, if the answer to the first is no, we can't find such mechanisms, then sort of what's the next best we can do? And the way this usually goes is that we come up with some kind of welfare function or some function of, of the outcome in the environment. We, uh, we attach to that some kind of likelihood function of what's going to be happening, some kind of probabilities, and then try to figure out what mechanism maximizes the expected value of the performance. Uh, that should have been... It's, uh, it's w, w should be in there somewhere. It's, max. Yeah, it's, it's, it's W should it's be in there. Yeah, I'm maximizing the expected value. So I, I, I've got the notation wrong here. I just do quick. But that's W of Z. You should be, max, this should be, you should be maximizing W Z. Okay, not P. But that's sort of the second best. Now, we'll, we'll see an example of this later. So th that's the sort of the general framework. And so for, for, to get some of the points across that I want to make, I'm going to work in a very simple environment, uh, public goods. Uh, it, 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 it just raises some of the issues. So I'm going to even work in a very simple public goods environment. There are only two types. Each, so there's a public good X, A1 to A N, or you can think of those as private good allocation taxes. The, the taxes that have to be paid have to add up to the cost of the public good. So if we're going to produce the public good, we have to collect taxes. If we don't produce the public good, we don't have to collect anything. Individuals have linear utility functions, theta i times the level of public good minus what the tax is. They have two types, either high or low. The low types are below the per capita cost of the public good if it's produced, and high types are above. Otherwise, it's not an interesting problem. This is a very simple thing. This, much of what I'm saying is going to generalize, but that's a simple world. First, what are first best allocations here? Well, generally, if we think in terms of efficiency, without, without necessarily committing to a particular uh, sort of welfare ranking, but just a Pareto criteria, sort of Pareto efficiency, in this world, the first best allocations maximize this function, which is just the, so the, the benefit, the aggregate benefit minus the cost of the public goods. So that just says, we produce if the good is if the sum of the theta i's is bigger than c. Somewhere in here, I should have said that x is a zero one variable. I oh. kind of conveniently forgot that x is zero or one. Okay, so that makes it uh, otherwise we have unbounded things here. And then we just any distribution of taxes is okay. And I'm going to impose a kind of a what's called sometimes called individual rationality or voluntary participation. I'm not going to allow taxation to put any individual in a situation worse than zero. Basically, their utility has to be at least as big as zero. Okay? And then the implementation question in this world is, for example, suppose I assume this sort of dominant strategy condition. Suppose I ask, is there a mechanism, a, a G and an M, such that there's a dominant strategy and the performance for that dominant strategy is the is an, is a first best allocation. And the answer to that is no, if the environment is rich enough. That's well known now. Um, this is, uh, so we can't do first best. We might be able to do second best. So here's an example of second best. <coughs> Suppose I think of a unanimity mechanism. So what I have in mind there is you're going to get to vote. <coughs> Zero, no, one, yes, whether you want the public good. So either I want it or I don't want it. If M equals one for everybody, so if we all vote yes, then the good is produced and everybody pays one over N of the cost. If anybody says no, if there's any MI equal to zero, the good's not produced and nobody pays anything. Okay, simple mechanism, all right. The strategy to vote yes if you're high, no if you're low, is a dominant strategy for this particular mechanism. Okay? The idea here is that if, you, if you're, in all cases where you're, uh, well, any case, I, I, I won't walk you through. I think you can probably see that if you think about it for a second. Okay? And so that's a dominant strategy mechanism. It's not efficient. 
doesn't necessarily produce first best. It gives us something. What it gives us, if we have an, if we're in the one environment where everybody is high, we get the public good. Otherwise, we get nothing. Yeah, that's, that's not a very satisfactory mechanism, but it, it is a dominant strategy mechanism. There, you might ask, is unanimity the best we can do? And it turns out, for this environment, if I restrict my attention only to the non-random mechanisms, mechanisms where we have to do it, the answer is yes, this seems to be the best we can do for this simple two-type world. Okay? If I have, basically what's going on, if, it, if you do any other sort of, if you produce the public good under any other number of high types, so if you say I'll produce it if and only if there are if there are at least four high types, okay. Uh, then, if there are, if there, if in the case where five people announce high, you'll have an incentive to announce low. So the so as long as there's less than full unanimity required, anybody who's sort of excessive in the high part is going to try to pretend to be low. And you're just not going to be able to get dominant strategies. Now there are other equal there are other Equilibrium concepts, other behavioral concepts you could throw at this, uh, Nash equilibrium, a variety of other things, but for dominant strategies, you're done. With random mechanisms, I have an example here. This is work in progress, obviously. Uh, a simple example for five people with costs of 25 and high types one and low types, I mean, low types one and high types n. We, can, we show that we get a dominant strategy mechanism where, which is random, which is better in some sense. It dominates, uh, uh, Pareto dominates the, the, the unanimity mechanism. And it says if four people say hi, then you do output 50-50. So you flip a coin. And so sort of once everybody announces, then you, the mechanism is we flip a coin. If it's heads, we produce, and everybody pays the, the, the height. You, know, you pay C over N, otherwise you don't produce. Okay. And with three, you just have a lower probability. And, and so you can, you can play games with this. I don't have a full characterization for this. I don't know anybody who does, sort of the full range of these mechanisms that work. But uh, these, are, the, these are the kinds of things you can look for. Okay. Now, the main point of all this is that you really, if you, if you want to use dominant strategies, if you want to look for do, mechanisms with dominant, now the reason we like dominant strategies is it doesn't require much rationality. So we don't need common knowledge of rationality. You don't need common knowledge of information. There's a lot of common knowledge stuff you can get rid of uh, with dominant strategies uh, that you can still make sense out of dominant strategies even without a lot of that common knowledge. So they're nice, but we can't get them very often. So what, where does neuroeconomics comes in? So there's a, we have a hypothesis. I say we, I should be more careful. It's the neuroeconomists at Caltech who have a hypothesis. I'm kind of a free rider on this. I'm one of the high types pretending to be low right now. I'm free riding on them. But uh, because I'm a little bit agnostic about what's going on in the neuroeconomics part of this, but I think it's worth throwing out here because it raises a number of interesting questions, both ethical and economics. So the hypothesis is that we can stick you in an MRI machine, and we get a signal out of that by, by looking at your head, your, your blood flow, basically. We get a signal that's correlated with your value. So I can stick you in the machine and figure out if you're high, I'm going to see a high signal with some probability. And if you're low, I'm going to see a low signal with some probability. So there's some correlation. Not perfect, just some. Then what I'm going to argue is I'm going to walk you through why we might believe that, whether we should believe it. Then I'm going to argue that if I can use that signal, first I'll get agents to announce their types. They're met, they're met, they vote yes or no. I don't care. I don't think of it announcing the type. But I'm going to use the signal now. So I'm going to, I'm going to have a mechanism which depends on their message the, out, the, the, the outcome choice and the taxes can now depend both on the messages submitted and the signals generated by the MRI machine. Okay, so I've got extra information. And the question is, now can I find a mechanism implementing first best and dominant strategies? And if the answer is, if I, if I require dominant strategies or ex post Nash kind of thing, after the signals and the messages are all in, the answer is no, because some, depending on the signal, you may want to change your report. Okay? 
But if I do everything before the signals are in, that is, if I, if I ask for dominant strategies pre-signal, I can get that. Okay? So that's a, I can get first best, I can, I can get the very best, as long as I have this kind of uh, sort of signal technology and, and I don't let people change their mind after we see the signal. Doesn't have some assumptions about the well, nature of the signal? I mean, yeah, I'll show, I'll show you in a minute. I'll come down to this. But the answer is going to be, I mean, it, turn, I mean it, it turns out as long as the signal's not 50-50, I can do something, but which is really strange. I mean, I may have to, I may have to, uh, we'll walk, I'll walk relying. you through. This is very Kramer McLean for those of you who, who thought about so, this so sort of thing. So you're relying a lot on risk neutrality. Yes, I am relying heavily on risk neutrality at some point. Yeah. yeah. That there's there's going to be risk neutral utility in here, so that, that's clear. I think. Well, we'll see where. Well, I mean, as I say, I'm totally agnostic about this. I'm I'm sort of trying to make the best case to begin with, and then we'll come back and sort of see what the hell went wrong or where, why we think this is silly. So the FMR procedure is, we're basically going to put a subject in, a, in an MRI machine. We give them instructions. They have a button box they put their finger on, they can put a zero or a one, a yes or a no kind of thing. And we're going to do a bunch of, ask them for responses while they're in the scanner. We're going to rant, we're going to draw, well, d depends, different experiments go differently. Sometimes we may, because you can do these things really, you can't do very complex things in the MRI machine, but you can do a lot. So once you get somebody in there, you might as well run them through 50, 50, 50 to 100 trials, right? So, so in the lab, you know, you, you can't do But you know, once you, you get these guys locked in, you run through 50, 60, 70, 100 things. You don't want to pay them for all those because it gets very expensive. So what we do is we pay them on a percentage of the, of, of the of we randomly draw a percentage of the things and pay them on that. And there are all sorts of issues with that compared to just pain. And again, risk attitudes matter. So, but, but sorry, if I just understand the timing, you would tell them beforehand what their payoffs are. Yeah, I'll show you the timing in just a second. Okay, okay. And that they're paid to show up. The, the the key thing here, I think, one of the key things that you keep in your mind is that they may have to wait two or three weeks for for our guys to do all the statistical analysis you need to do to figure out what the hell that damn signal was. So there's a, a lag between the time they make all these decisions and the time they actually get the paycheck. So it's a little, the technology is slow, bulky, and it's not, you know, we're still learning. All right? So the timing, this is a typical MRI experiment. We flash a screen, this starts up here. We flash a screen tells them what their value is. It's a high number or a low number, okay? And they know ahead of time that there's a, there are two different experiments. One is where there's a random variable between eight and 10 or zero and two, and there's another one where there's just a high number and a low number. But they, you get a value, and then there's a lag in here. This, this is four seconds, and what you do is every time between you get one of these screens, this goes in between, this is what's called a fixation screen. And I'm not a neuroeconomist, so you have to, Somebody else have to explain why all of this is necessary. But then we tell them what kind of what kind of gain they're in. So the, the value comes from so the gain. This one's the group size is five and the cost is 25. We do different sizes. And then we, we ask them what they want to announce. Do they want to announce that they're a high type or a low type? So this is like voting yes or voting no. And then on a bunch, some of the trials, we ask them whether the, lat, the digit of their value is even or odd. At this point, that's after we get down here, just to see whether they're staying awake in the machine, because people, people have a tendency to get bored. And so this is, this is kind of an alert system. If they start missing this, we know there's something wrong. Okay? So there's a lot of stuff going on here. But this, is the, this is sort of neuroeconomics. And so this is the theory of it. It's function, it's basically oxygen and, uh, you know, uh, Increased blood flow, brain activity is supposedly correlated with increased blood flow, and if you measure the increased blood flow, you can get some correlation with the activity. This is a very noisy signal. There's a lot of, a lot of noise. There's spatial correlation and a temporal correlation uh, in the, all, the, all the pixels, all the numbers you were connecting. But in the end, the idea is that you can get, you can measure sort of the, 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 the blood flow you get when they say when they have a high type and a blood flow when they have a low type, and you hope there's a difference in those two, and what you look for is you subtract one from the other, so all this other extraneous stuff goes away, and you hope you get a something that differentiates the two values. So the presumption here is when they think about value, there's a place in the head that does some kind of calculation. 
So we use, they use an SVM machine learning algorithm to convert these data into a judgment of higher low. So there's a lot of statistical, what I think of as statistical analysis is basically a lot of computation going on behind with all these data being generated to get the simple thing. What's the probability, you know, is it a high or is it a low? Okay, so that's all you're, it's all you're trying to get out. What's the accuracy? So here's the accuracy for 13 subjects that they've done. The, on the left is the, uh, it was whether, so what we do is we do this analysis, then we go back into the data and, and say, okay, if we saw this at this time, would we have predicted high or would we have predicted low? And since we've done 50 of these, and what we get is the, the tri these are the trials that were classified correctly. So it's the percentage of things we did the correct classification for. And this is the subject number. And you can see that two subjects, we didn't do so good. That's 50-50. And that will that'll turn out to be a problem. The rest of these are above 50%. And the average is 60%. Now, I'm, I've been told by my, my neuro friends that they can do better, that they're just really getting started at this. And that they, if they finally figure out which voxels in the brain to look at correctly, they'll get a 60-70% all the time. Uh, I don't know. That's that's the question of, of, of validity of, of sort of of, of this process. So is that going to be sort of the uh, out, out of the sample uh, prediction accuracy? Yeah. This is this is uh, well. It's not, it, it's not clear. I mean, I'm having this long running debate with these guys about what it is they're really doing, right? Because they they're doing they're taking these 50 trials with this guy. Then they're doing uh, they're doing they take 49 of them and do something and then predict something on the 50th. So it's kind of that kind of thing. But then they do this 50 times. They do this, they take another 49 and do, you know, sort of as for each single, so there's 50 ways to do 49 things. And then they take all that and make some claim. And at this point I'm getting confused, you know, I'm not sure what I should believe or not, okay? What I think is, it, we'll see a little later, we have some experiments coming up that are more tightly controlled given what we've figured out on the theory side. I mean, this, this was sort of done without any theory. This was sort of begun as a project just to see whether they could do it. So we have some more experiments. But this is, uh, so, the, but the, 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 there is some, there is apparently some ability by these guys to identify whether that guy was looking at a high signal or a low signal. Now that's, remember that's looking at it. This is not as if we got three guys, roommates trying to decide whether to buy a TV set and who's gonna pay for it. And we, we just, we, we, we sit them in the MRI and then flash them a picture of the TV and ask what are they seeing. This is them seeing this sign that says $1.56. So we're a long ways away from deciding what, let, how big a park to build in the city on the basis of the MRI. But it's, we're, this is sort of, at some level, a possibility. Okay. All right, so if I, follow, if I assume the follow, following neurotechnology, which is that there's a signal, and the probability I see the signal is high when the person announces high is some number P and it's bigger than 0.5. And so I'll see the low signal with one minus p. And then I have the same thing for low, there's a probability more than 0.5 that works. And I, that's all I need is more than 50-50. So I need, and obviously if it was 40-60, that would be okay too, just take the inverse. But so just as long as I'm don't not, just as long as I'm not totally confused, something systematic, I need something systematic. So I'm gonna consider a special mechanism now. So same public goods problem, Let's let k star be the minimum k such that I, that I want to have the good around. So this, is, this just says this is the minimum number of high types such that at that point it's efficient to produce the good. Below that, it's not efficient to produce the good. And I'm going to let h be the number of high types. So what I'm going to say if it's, so the mechanism goes as follows. If, a, if the number of high types is bigger than or equal to k star, I produce it. Low types pay nothing. High types play their share of the cost. Very simple. So anybody who votes yes, if it's produced, pays their share of the cost. If, it's, if the M is less than K star, nobody, nothing happens, nobody pays anything. Okay, very simple. If I could get people to tell me the truth here, that would, be a, that would be a first best mechanism. It would be a nice mechanism. 
How am I going to do that? I'm going to create a new mechanism. I'm going to use this mechanism, this sort of thing to start with. So the output decision is going to be based on announcements. The tax you pay is going to be based on this, but I'm going to add some terms. So what are these terms? Each person is going to have a, 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 a payment they're going to make. This is a tax, which is going to be depending on the, the message they quote, so what type they claim to be, and the signal that comes back. Okay. And then I'm going to, what I'm going to do with these taxes, I'm going to, I'm going to collect them from everybody, the signal and the message, and I put them in a pot, I divide them up by in, and I get them back. So this is just basically make sure I balance out the pot. And this is very similar to kind of a Cremere McLean approach where you have, a, where the independent signal, where the correlated signal in that is other people's types because the, the, the theta i and theta j are assumed to be correlated and you can play off against that. Here I've got this independent signal which is not depending on anybody's and I don't therefore need to worry about, well, we'll see. In any case, this adds up, this is a balanced budget mechanism. It always, you know, we never collect more from the people than we need for the public good. And so the argument is uh, if I let this be, now, I am, sorry, I'm going to let this be the expected value of that payment you have to make if you given if you announce MI and, and SI as signal given your type theta I. So this this gets this kind of just is your expected payment if you're type theta you announce MI. Okay? Now putting this in here says I've gone a little bit past dominant strategies at this point. So I got to be a little you know somebody should sort of say whoa wait a minute you know you're assuming that individuals are, I'm going to use this as a kind of a risk, as risk neutral. So as Eric pointed out, this is risk neutrality. I'm assuming that individuals know what the technology, the, the, the computer, the neurotechnology is and that they believe it. So they, they've got, they, they believe it totally and they understand it. And I'm assuming implicitly at this point it's not manipulable either. So we'll come back to that. Uh, and then, so what I have is now I have a utility function which depends on a sort of an expected utility. It's not expected in the terms of what the other people are doing. So it's not expected in terms of, of the other people's messages. The expectation only comes up in sort of how I view the, the computer, the neurotechnology. Okay. Voluntary participation, this is the sum of the others types. I don't have any control over that, but it does have an effect on voluntary participation, so I have to worry about that. Turns out voluntary participation says that my expected payment, if I tell the truth, this is this this is this kind of you know sort of uh, truth check. Think of it as a kind of a truth check in the machine. That my payment from that process is going to be has to be less than or equal to the minimum payment of any of any anything of anybody. Incentive compatibility for low types. It turns out you get a similar kind of restriction. The only thing I need to make sure is that I charge. If you tell, if you misrepresent, your pay, your expected payment's going to be higher than if you tell the truth. That's why is that? Because lows have no incentive to misrepresent in this in this mechanism, in the original mechanism, because they, they they gain nothing by pretending to be high. They just get the, they get the good and they have to pay something, and they're worse off than if they don't say anything. So lows never want to misrepresent. Highs, on the other hand, will want to pretend to be low as I described it, if they are kind of an extra high type. So if, they're ex if, they're, if, they're, if the target is three and there are five guys announced high, you want to pretend to be out. You want to say, I'm low, because you still get the public good and you don't have to pay anything. This is the extent of that benefit you gain by announcing low. And what we require is that the tax on you from pretending to be low when you're high, the expected tax on you when you pretend to be low to be high, is big enough to, to overcome that. So this says, you know, if you're, you're going to take a chance by pretending to be low, and if in, in the expected terms, it's going to be more than you ever hope to gain in the mechanism. Okay, and you know, we, I can push this around and everything, uh, but it, it turns out that the these are the payments. These are not now the expected payments. These are the actual payments. What the the pay, a payment class that works is if you announce high. There's nothing. We don't check you. If you announce high, we figure, hey, you know, that's great. If you announce low, we got to figure out whether you're really low or whether you're a high pretending to be low. And what we do is we put you in the machine. If we get, if you announce low and we see a high signal, 
we hit you up with a penalty. If, we, if you announce low and we see a low signal, we give you a payment. Okay? And this lambda out here scales these to be big enough so that the expected value is high enough. And this is a way, this, and this mechanism implements the first best. Okay? So we have this kind of, uh, so if the tech, so the, the, the result here is, one second, if the technology works, we can get first best allocations by, at least in this environment I've described. I think, personally, I believe these results are much more general. That is, it when there are multiple types, we have to be careful about some additional things and, there, and, and some things like that. But there's nothing specific to this particular situation. So we get that. You, is there power in I announced, I announced low, and now you tell me I can go to the MRI machine. You can pay me if I go or not. Is, isn't there something you can do here? Well, the way I interpret these numbers is that if you announce high, we don't care about what happens in the IMR. You just go away. You, know, you don't have to show up for your MRI. I mean, it's a little bit like the IRS. You send in an income tax form. You say, here's my income. Here's what I owe you. I send the check. I'm done. Right? And some people, they audit and some they don't. So we're not going to audit high types. But a low type, we're going to say, you got to show up. And we're going to, you know, we're going to audit. You yeah. You know, well, I don't know. Now, I'd say, I don't know. And I don't also, I don't, I also don't know. So I'm, well, I'm going to describe sort of, let me, let me, let me say a couple of more things and we'll come back. So. First thing is that, suppose, so this is a question of manipulation. Suppose I am smart enough that I can fool the MRI machine. I can manipulate this probability of you discovering who I am. Okay? It turns out if I can do that selectively, that is if I can fool it when I'm low, but not when I'm high or, or differentially when I'm high or low, then that can cause trouble for this mechanism. Okay? Then, it could, then, it, then we lose some of the power of the mechanism. But if they, if you can only affect essentially the probability of telling whether you're high when you're high, and if that's the same as when you're low and you're low, and you can only move these together, then I don't have a problem. As long as we keep it away from 0.5, we can do something. Okay? And it turns out that, that at, at some level, it's in your interest. It's a little hard to prove it. It's in your interest to actually push the the, the, the accuracy of this test up because it lowers the variance of this penalty. So if you have any risk attitudes at all, you want to kind of minimize that. I put this here because I had a whole other section I was going to talk about on the effect of other regarding preferences on mechanism design. I've taken it out because it was I didn't have enough time, basically. I had something else I wanted to talk about. Um, but what's next is we're going to actually run experiments where the instructions, they have instructions about what's coming. They're told the mechanism, this mechanism. We're going to do that. We're going to put them in the MRI machine, and we're going to run it. Okay. Now, notice what we're going to do. We're still debating whether you check the signal before the announcement or you get the announcement before the signal. Does it matter? I don't know. I mean, these are little details that, that we're sort of wrestling over. But the idea is that we're going to curious is number one, do we get dominant strategy behavior? Number two, are we measure, do we get the kind of signal behavior we think we're going to get? A uh, whole number of other kind of behavioral questions that come up. But so this is uh, so that's what's next. Okay, uh, John. So you mentioned the connection to Kramer McLean. Is it? Actually, a corollary in the sense that in your framework you have a planner who's getting these signals. Yeah, it could be. It, you, you can yeah, it, it, it could be. I haven't had time to to do the calculation, and I was, I just didn't get it done. So that that's obviously the next thing. I, there's some general theorems here that I think I can crank out over the next couple of months when I get a couple of minutes to do some work. But uh, that I that are very, I think basically may be just corollaries of Kramer. In which case, they won't be all that interesting to mechanism designers. But so, I mean, at some level, the interest here is in the existence of a technology. The Cremer McLean results rely on you having common knowledge about the pro, uh, sort of the, the belief structures. I mean, it's, it sort of goes be way beyond robustness. Okay, so that that 
you can't get, I don't think that you get the Cremer and McLean with just dominant strategy. The fact, what? Well, I thought that you were actually doing Bayes and Equilibrium here. I'm doing, if we're thinking about this pre-signal, okay, take the, taking, take, it's Bayesian with respect to the signal. The fact, if I announce M, and then if I announce M, here's my expected payment I'm going to have to make if I announce M and I'm actually theta, okay? That requires on you having beliefs about the computer, about the neurotechnology, period. Everything else is dominant strategy. So in the message, once you, everybody announces their messages, you're happy to have your message be the same thing. It's got ex post pre-signal, okay? So after all everybody's messages are there, it's a dominant strategy to tell the truth. Post-signal it's not, but that's a different thing. And it doesn't rely on, it doesn't rely on common knowledge of, or of, of information or of rationality on the part of anybody else. It relies on each individual believing this technology and believing the expected payment is going to be set. So it doesn't sound like it's a corollary. It's not a corollary, probably. I mean, it's, it, the principles are the same, that the, the kind of the idea is the same, that you can take the first best and tack on this thing, which depends on all these prob probabilities. But it's a little different because I come out with a much different, and the fact, it's because this signal is totally independent of anybody else. It doesn't depend on anybody else. This is generated in, by out of your brain and your, your, your dimension. Eric. You, you mentioned the manipulability <coughs> on the part of individuals, but what, what about just uh, heterogeneity? That is, uh, uh, some people are correlated. One okay, so that, I, I, here I've assumed there's a single probability. Right. If there's mul if there multi if 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 there so if there are different probabilities, the issue is do I need to know them ahead of time or not? Sort of how do I you know that? I, I mean I can certainly write out that equation, put eyes on it for each individual. I can put a QI and a PI here and an RI and make the individual payments if I know the PI and the QI but is any, ahead of time. But is there any reason why you should have the individual data? You, you can understand how this information so, might be collected yeah. in a statistical sense, but on an individual well, sense, it's... Well, so, this is, a, so yeah. this is, you know, would I have the data? So my, so the way you, th I mean, I have a whole bunch of other things I want to talk about. I, ra I, br I put this up here just to raise some of these questions because, for example, maybe I don't even need to audit all the low types. I just randomly pick three or four of them and say, okay, you guys are up. And if you, if I, if your signal's different from what you say, even though it's possible for that to happen for everybody, I'm going to shoot you though. You know, I mean, if you just, you know, if you're, if you announce low and I get a high signal, I'm going to say, sorry, even though you might really be low, but I have no way of knowing, right? You could, you could raise the penalty significantly on everybody and just randomly sample a few. I mean, there's all sorts of badge and technology here. I still am not comfortable with how this would work in sort of, you know, do I know ahead of, enough ahead of time to set up the mechanism before I put somebody into the machine? Do I need to put the mechanism together after? Do I need to run you through the machine and then decide how to, you know, I mean, this is, and sort of, you know, in the end, sort of uh, this, that, 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 you know, the question is, is sort of commitments on the part of the mechanism manager as opposed to the agents. I mean, there's just all huge issues here. And I don't even, you know, I, think, I just think it's fun because it just raises a lot of interesting questions. Okay, so I want to switch gears. I want to get closer to the topic of the uh, uh, session. That was my attempt to introduce you to mechanism design in a fun way, I did, but it took longer than I was going to. So, question is, how do you, how do we apply mechanism design? All this stuff I've been talking about is fun. There's a whole line of work for theorists that has been absolutely enjoyable and delightful. Uh, but some of us actually like to go out and make this stuff work in the real, sort of out in the world. Uh, and the question is sort of, what do you do when you do that? What happens? And the, the, so if I, if, if I think of that public goods problem, you might be three guys deciding to buy a TV and a house and you gotta figure out how it could be a department deciding what the rules of the game should be and making hiring decisions. Could be at the national level, it's uh, how much do we spend on national defense and who pays for it, or at the 
global level, sort of what should be the level of CO2 emissions in the world and who should be doing which, where, what. These are all different kinds of problems that have this sort of public good nature to it, but they're even private good problems. Sponsored search on the internet, there are tons of them. What do we do? We start out making our best guess about the world that we're playing in. What's the class of environments that we might be dealing with? We don't know the specific parameters, but we want to kind of get the class pinned down. And then we have to guess what the kind of behavior is that the people that we're going to be putting this mechanism are going to follow. We use theory, once we have that, we can use theory as a guide to choose a mechanism. We've, uh, that, that's real, real work of, of Meyerson, Eric, and some others. We, we found we've got really neat tricks for converting these, these very <coughs> complex mechanism design problems into an optimization problem. So if we can get it written out right and we have a big enough computer, we can kind of sometimes solve for the optimal mechanism. But many times it's NP complete, it's just ugly. And so we don't always, aren't always, even if we can write it out, we can't solve it. So what we do sometimes is we scale this thing back down, go into an experimental economics lab and test the mechanism there. And this gives us some shot at knowing whether things are gonna fall apart or not. It is scaling that. It's very much like an aeronautical wind, engineering wind tunnel. It's the same principle as that, okay? And if it doesn't work, we revise our, either it doesn't work because the behavior seems different than we thought, or if, you know, for the mechanism isn't working the way we thought it was, we have to revise the behavior, revise the mechanism, we go back to the lab, we keep doing this iterative process. When you design the, the, F, the FCC auction was designed for, uh, uh, the, the auction was designed for the FCC, the, the mechanism was designed by theorists, uh, Wilson, McAfee, and, and, uh, and Milgram are among the names you'll recognize that did the work. They didn't have a clue what the hell was gonna happen. They had a theory about auctions of a single item by very rational bidders. This was an auction of multiple items simultaneously being sold with complementarities and all sorts of things. So they were guessing, some, some principles but guessing. We did do some testing. Actually, FCC thought it would be worthwhile trying some testing out of the thing. So at Caltech, we did a whole bunch of testing of it. We made some significant suggestions for changes in rules, some of which were agreed to, some of which weren't. But it, some of it actually saved a piece of the pie. But uh, the, that, that sort of went on. But at the end, I think nobody really knows to this day whether that was the best optimal design, whether that was the optimal design. This is the whole field of combinatoric auctions is about sort of trying to figure this out. And we're still arguing with each other about a lot of it. But the point is that this process takes a long time. So I'm going to give you a quick example. I'm running out of time. I'm supposed to stop in five minutes. I will, this is going to be quick. Can I take about five extra minutes maybe? I'll try to make this reasonably quick. I'm going to work in quadratic environments now instead of linear environments. Why? Just because it's more interesting. The linear environment is kind of a very limited special case. So quadratic, people have, now this is still public good, people have quadratic preferences for the public good. YI is going to be the tax you pay and so forth. Efficiency now is not a, a, either produce or not produce. We have different levels of output of the public good. And the optimal level is a, computable from the preferences. That's all you need to know. There's a mechanism, this is work I did with Ted Groves, where that works the following, people are sending a message, a number, we add them up, that's gonna be the level of public good. And then people pay taxes, they pay a proportional tax, one over n times the, the cost of the public good, plus a thing here, a term, this is an arbitrary parent, whoops, arbitrary number. That's any number, gamma is any number bigger than zero. Take your pick. This is the, your message minus the, the average of the others. So this is a, how much you differ from the others. And this is the variance of the others. It's not affected by your message. I'm, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. The theoretical finding that was interesting, then at least, was that if you look at Nash equilibrium behavior, that is if you assume agents will behave and choose Nash equilibria, that the Nash equilibria will be Pareto optimal no matter what gamma is. That this is a mechanism which if people follow Nash behavior, 
produces Pareto optimal behavior. Okay, first step. And it doesn't matter what gamma is. Gamma can be anything. Okay? So that's a, that, that has some prop, nice properties. People object to it because it's Nash instead of dominance or Bayesian, but it's, it has some nice properties. Yan Chen and uh, Tang and also Yan Chen and Charlie Plott ran some experiments with this trying to figure out does it really work if you ask people to do this in a lab. And they chose gamma 1 and gamma 100. And what they found is that, it, that in the lab, it ne people never chose Nash equilibria when gamma was 1. They were... It's not clear what they were doing, but they weren't choosing gamma equals one. With gamma equal 100, they, they converged on the Nash equilibrium in a repeated play of this game. So they played the game repeatedly in, nine, in an average of nine periods. So if they play it for 100 periods, in about nine periods on average, they hit Nash equilibrium and they stay there in the lab. Okay? That, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting finding. They get close enough. And the thing is that gamma, that says that gamma matters in the design. We, you know, the theory, the static theory says it doesn't matter. You get Nash equilibrium is pretty out The dynamic, in the repeated play and kind of this adapt, I'm going to argue in this kind of adaptive behavior of the subjects, which is what it looks like, the gamma matters. It affects dynamics. In fact, Yan Chen made the conjecture that it was supermodularity that was at work which is a form of gross substitute kind of condition that Ken and Leo, among others, came up with to figure out the price dynamics. And if that, in this case, super, once gamma is bigger than or 80, you get supermodularity, and they thought that was what was happening. So, but it wasn't clear. So you said if I was going to run this mechanism, I was actually going to use this to make a public good decision. What gamma would I pick? You know, how, how would I do it? Do I have to... Do I have to run experiments with all of the gammas? Can I use some simulations? Sort of what can I do? Sort of what theory do I have here? How do I go? So Yasmin Arifovich and I have a model of adaptive behavior, a learning kind of model, how you, how you learn in a repeated game. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but basically says that you keep around. It's very evolutionary and, and genetic in, in, uh, in flavor, but it's evolutionary inside your own head. It's not social evolution. So it, you're... you're you keep around a bunch of strategies at the end of a move. You go through them. You pick them out. You, if, if, they, if they would have performed well the last time, you kind of hang on to it. If it wouldn't have performed well, you throw it out. You, run, you, you compare them with each other, and you're more likely to keep the better performing ones. And then you, and occasionally you just try something new, mutation, if you want. You randomly pick something. And we have this, this is a kind of a simple thing. And then you just sort of play randomly out of this set of strategies. Okay. We ran simulations with this world and these ex the same experiments that Yan Shen and, and Plot and others ran. And what we found was that, that when gamma equals the one in our simulations, we get conversion that takes about 100, 800, I mean, no, I think about 900 rounds to get any kind of conversion. But very, for very low values of gamma, we started, this is time to converge, this is the size of gamma. We get convergence and notice it minimized somewhere around 50, not 80. So we were getting pretty fast convergence before the supermodularity point. What okay. is that the vertical axis? The, the vertical axis is the average time to converge on the Nash equilibrium in repeated play. Uh, this is a simulation. So uh, this is a simulation. Here, what are those? What's, what's, say, the first dot? Uh, I just want to know oh, what the numbers are? This number is 15 here. Okay. This is 20. Okay, okay. So when we're doing 50, we're, we're, I'll show you we're some numbers here. Here's some numbers. For 30 and 50 and 100, we're converging about seven, eight rounds. This, this algorithm we have, which is just, and it starts out totally ignorant. It, it starts out with nothing. It randomly seeds and then goes. So that's pretty fast. What's the learning process? It's, you, 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 you take a move and then you, comp you, you look at, you do a, a, you do a, 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 a you could want to call it a hypothetical analysis. You say, of all the strategies I'm keeping track of, and I can't keep track of them all because it's a continuum, but I yeah. keep together some seed. Of all these, uh, for each one, I look at what would it have done if I had played it last time instead of the one I really did. So it's a very myopic, mm -hmm. uh, best, better reply kind of thing. But it's got a bunch of randomness in it to keep it from overreacting and various other things. Okay? 
And ours is done in a very simple case. You can have a, a strategy can be a series of plays, too. There's nothing that restricts it to be just a single response. It can be a planned series of plays, can be a strategy. But th those are the numbers. We get sort of the learning and the question, of course, the issue is do people actually behave that way? Well, being at Caltech, we said, okay, let's go back to the lab. Can you say how you uh, started the initial point? The initial, the initial point, we randomly, we ba basically, so the experiments were run, subjects were constrained to choose numbers between minus, uh, between minus four and plus six. So the way we started this, we, we had, we had, we, we, for this, we, I think we used 500 was the size of the strategy set we came around. So we randomly chose 500 numbers between, my, between minus four and six. Just randomly picked them out of the strategy space. The totally neutral beginning. Okay, so it worked. We were really kind of pleased. It worked pretty well. It looked like gamma was playing a role. The dynamics were different than you get from just best response, Cornell, or any kind of even super even kind of adaptive things in supermodular behavior. And so the question was, what happens if you run experiments? Well, we ran experiments and we got these kind of, these are the average rates of convergence. The subjects are getting to Nash equilibrium a lot faster than our model is. They're getting down here three, two, and two. And remember ours were up around seven, eight, or nine. But the convergence is still U-shaped. 50 is still the minimum average time, you know, 50. so. So at some sense, the, the, the basic features of, this, of our simulations are, are fit the basic features of this, the lab. So it looks like that seems to work. The humans are a little faster than our simulation and more, are, are more stable and, and so therefore yield higher efficiencies, but that's what's going on. As I say, 50 minimizes the time to converge under both of these. So this is a case where the simulations allowed us the simulations of adaptive behavior. So it's adaptive behavior simulation, but taking a hard, sort of the mechanism designer saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the best I can against this behavior, we'd get 50. So the argument is if we wanna go run this in, in the real world, we choose gamma. No, that's not quite right. Uh, where do I wanna go to here? The problem is I can't just say the best Groves ledger mechanism is 50 now. 50 works great for that set of preference parameters and for five people and a cost of whatever it was. If I change the parameters and I change the cost and I change things, I may change the way the gamma affects the behavior. So I have that problem. For example, we did some simulations and I'm not gonna, we have never run the experiment. We did some simulations when in grows, we replicated this economy. We just made it bigger and bigger. And it turns out that the, the simulated convergence behavior is constant in gamma divided by the, the number of simulation, uh, number of replications. So the larger the economy, the bigger gamma you need to get this minimum convergence. And so what we need is gammas of the order of 10 times n. So we need to know how big a problem we're dealing with, not just that we also need to know how many different preferences there are. So there's a lot we don't know. Question, do we have to go back to the lab to check this? We have to go through all the goddamn, excuse me, all the various sizes of, of, of economies, all the various permutations of parameters. It's not possible, okay? So what, what can we do this design while we put the mechanism to work? So let's, so we go put this, we say, okay, well, we can make a guess. Whoops. Uh, uh, I probably did something I shouldn't have done. Oh, I see what he did. Okay, now I'm done. Okay. So the question is, can we become adaptive ourselves? Can the mechanism designer be adaptive? Can we say, okay, well, this is our best guess. Let's put this into play. And now let's sort of fiddle with it. Can we set up sort of rules to change the gamma as we go? And if we push this a little further, can we do that automatically somehow? Can I, can I provide protocols or algorithms that'll sit there doing it? For this simple example, I'm just talking about fiddling with gamma, but you could imagine a larger problem, take sponsored search, where we're trying to sell millions and millions of, uh, or banner spaces on millions and millions of different web pages as they pop up. And the way it's done now is there are all sorts of instantaneous auctions that are held, but nobody knows whether this is the best mechanism. Yahoo may has their approach, Google has their approach. And the question is sort of what's, how can, and we also don't know for sure how people, what behavior people are using. Is it, 
competitive? Is it, do we take prices as given or not? Is it some kind of dominance? Do we believe, have preferences? How are our expectations loaded into this? What's happening? And so the question is, is there a, a this is sort of out on the edge. There are computer scientists worrying about this. There are economists worrying about it. So it's, I'm not saying anything that other people haven't thought about. I don't want to make that claim. But I think this is sort of a wide open area for the area of sort of applied mechanism design. Now, I'm not sure where the mathematician comes into this. As a theorist, I keep looking for theoretical problems in these things. But some of this is, uh, and I think there is theory to be developed here, a, a lot of theory. But it's the, op the open question is, can, you know, if agents are behaving adaptively, if we don't know exactly what this adaptive behavior is, can we, do we, as, can we become adaptive, uh, sort of as purposively adaptive mechanism designers? Can we be sort of steering the adaptation? So I'm going back to the old design question. Can we find ways to, to be proactive to move the, the flow, as, you, as Ken was pointing out, in a way that's useful for the, or for the society, whatever that is. And I'm, I'll be agnostic on value here. So that's, that's where I'm in now. So that's, this is a, some, something I'm working on, and I think it's fun. Okay, so that's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Have you thought of using stochastic approximation? Yeah, I, 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 the answer is the answer is yes, and the problem is that I'm, to be perfectly honest, I used to be really pretty good at stochastic processes, and I hadn't used them for a long time. I'm getting old, and I'm going to have to retool up. But I've become aware of a number of sort of really interesting approximation theorems. Because the Russians, Sitkin, especially many years ago, looked yeah. at problems like this, yeah. and he very well, I mean, this theory I have right now, which is which we only have, we don't have full theorems for it, for the behavioral theory I have, this adaptive behavior, is essentially a stochastic process, it's adaptive behavior. And the answer is, yeah, it's, that's the appropriate mathematics to start thinking about some of this. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm just saying, yes, I agree. Brian? Brian? Uh, have you um, taken your adaptive learning model and tested it against the kinds of data that people do learning models and games? No, I have. Well, we did. We, we, what, what I have done is I've taken the EWA model of camera, which is a generalization of the, the, the old uh, Bush-Mosteller model, which now Roth and Arab get more credit for than they do. But basically that... EWA model is, we've done that, we've used EWA in this public goods simulations and it never, it doesn't, it takes hours to convert, I mean many, many periods to converge. It doesn't behave very well. We've not done the reverse. We haven't gone back and said, okay, how does this work on Prisoner's Dilemma or Trust Games or Ultimatum Games or, we just haven't done that. Part of the reason is that ours, we think, we think of our model as designed for continue, spaces in which choices are a continuum, not just Two, one or two things. It, it sort of those games are very, in some sense, really kind of very simple. Okay, what we did apply it to the public goods game, the voluntary participation game. It died. It doesn't do very well. Why? Because it converges to essentially Nash equilibrium. So there, it just die. It converges. People start out contributing, but they they get to zero contribution very quickly. But we know in the lab, that's not what happens. And for some values of the parameters, people actually contribute 40 or 50 percent, even after 10 or 15 periods. Well, if we change the utility function to include another regarding behavior, so you care about the average payout to everybody, and then you also have a negative utility a la Fair Schmidt from being getting less payout than everybody else does. If you, we do that, and then we assume there's heterogeneity in those tastes in the environment. And we, we assume we have, it's fairly robust to the probability distributions we assume, but we assume some particular probability distribution. And then we go back and run our simulations again. They look really good in compared to sort of the data we've looked at so far. They, they behave, that they start out contributing a lot and they converge down. Where they converge to depends on the proportion, depends on some specific numbers as to how many people have higher low values for altruism, higher low values for something. We can pin that down. And so 
we have to change the utility function, though, and it's not the function that the lab gives. It's something they bring to the lab with them. So it works well for that, but we haven't done any of the real simple games. It wouldn't be that hard to do, and one of these days I'll get a student I can beat over the head to get through it. They don't believe, my students just don't do what I tell them to do. They go off and do other things. I actually have one student working. Do you have one left? Yeah. I have one student working on the minimum effort game in this sense. So we're trying, we're getting there. So it's a good question. Yeah. So in the lab, these people converge to NASH play, and then they just stay there? They just stay there pretty much. By converge, I mean they get within, you know, within a narrow band of it. Okay, so one thing, I guess, in an applied mechanism design you'd be interested in is the robust, so if this system is somehow disturbed, does it reconverge? I mean, what sort of stability is it? So one experiment we've done is if we change the parameters on the utility functions and then just let the system, don't tell the computer agents, because of the occasional trying of different things, even when you're, so what happens in our agents, they start, their set of actions tends to be all the same action after a point. That's why they're basically at NASH equilibrium. They just don't, you know, but occasionally they try something else, but it gets thrown out because it's not as good as what they have. But if things move, that try starts, so what happens is the minute that, the minute they try once and see that there's a higher payoff in this direction, they start reseeding the whole set. And you get, you get a little slower than the convergence we'd get when you do fully random at the beginning, but you get some kind of move to it. So it does adapt. We tried to run the lab experiment to do this, and when we did it, we were using, the software crashed in the first experiment we did. We ran out of money, and we're still trying to get more money to do those experiments, but we haven't done them yet. My hunch is the humans will move pretty fast, too. Maybe, probably faster than our, than our, 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 our agents are a little slow. But not that slow. I mean, to get there in five or six moves is pretty good. Maybe Caltech students are a little fast. Well, that's the, that, so our, my, my, so I, I thought that if I could go do, you know, that, that's, I won't say, yeah. I wish I hadn't tried this on them first, because I think I would have been closer to what actually happened. Go back to Northwestern, try it there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've done it in Michigan. We did, we did, the Michigan data are significantly different. And the, we, you know, we did one run at UCLA, and it was even worse than the Michigan data, so it's not clear. No, you don't. There are subject pool differences, unfortunately. We, experimentalists, and I will claim that for the most part, subject pool doesn't matter. But things like this, it matters a lot. And so there is heterogeneity in either it's, either it's how fast you're, how much you can, you know, how big, so in our case, how big a strategy set can you consider and keep track of, things like that. I don't know. It's a good question. It's a, it's a perfect remark. My, my colleagues will deny it to their death. <laughs> Any other comments? Questions? I have a question. It's yeah. uh, it really affected Caltech. When you tell them the game, you don't give them that equation, do you? Yep. <laughs> I do. At Caltech, I do. We do two things. We do two things. So at Michigan, what Yan did was she, she, she didn't give them the equation, but what she did was uh, she gave them a, a, a chart which had sort of curves, here's what if, here's what if the, they do, here's if you do, this is what your payoff will be in different colors. It was hard to figure out how to read. So what we did, one thing, and this is, this is where the, the, the subject pool thing may not be quite as bad, we added something that she didn't have. We added something called a what if. So we gave them a calculator at the top, at, at the page, they could enter in a, here, if this is the average of the other's messages, and here's the variance, and here's my message, here's what I'll get. And you could run through, and we, this is a Z-tree program, so each time they did a calculation like that, the, the, the computer kept track of it. So we have a record of that. So they could, they could do a what-if calculation. And that certainly speeds things up. Um, and what we found was, is we haven't done a full analysis on it. In the early periods, you got lots of what-ifs. So in the first two, three, four, five periods, there's lots of what-if count. And after a while, it just went off. They just stopped doing it. It became, you know, they just were... They were kind of locked in on best reply at that point. So it's, uh, that was, yeah, but I mean, but yes, we gave them, being Caltech, I gave them the equation. I don't know that they read it. Being Caltech also, our subjects don't read instructions. There's this, there's this generation, they open up the game box, they take out, you know, Road Warrior, and they put it in the computer, and they start playing it. Nobody asks 
to read the instructions anymore. And that's how they do some of our experiments. So you get some kind of, you know, they're fast enough to figure it out halfway in the middle of the experiment, so we get lucky, you know, so it's good. But it, it means that we get sort of not always as careful writing instructions as we should, because we can get away with a lot. Do you have any, any reason to explain your curve when gamma gets yeah. large and we get a minimum around 50 to 100, and then it starts shooting up? Yeah, it shoots why, does it, part why, does it why does it go back up? Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I have a suggestion. It goes back up because the weight it gets as you put. So remember what it's uh, it's multiplying. It's multiplying this term, which has the it's a penalty thing. So the higher it gets, the more you get penalized for being different from the mean of the others. It's still better to be different, but if it's really large, say gamma equals five thousand, then what you're going to want to be fairly close to the average of the others. It's going to Cause you not to move quite as fast, okay? So I mean, that's that's the intuitive reason. It's it's uh, it's essentially that that payoff bec that that penalty becomes sort of more salient and more salient, more salient. Now it's still optimal in equilibrium to be at messages which are in Nash equilibrium and not be on that message. You want to be different from it, but if you're out of equilibrium, you're gonna it's gonna you're gonna get you're gonna be very careful about moving away from it. It's going to be hard for you to find. That better. becomes the optimiz optimizing function. Though. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Eric? No. Oh. Then what? So you guys looking forward to the neuro experiment? Huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like it. Next time I have open. The brave new world is upon us. You be careful. Yeah. <laughs> I just, something a little more open-ended about yeah. the research agenda in a second. Sure. So um, oh. so one goal would be to actually have a model that can replicate the trajectory that the participants will generate while yeah. they're experimenting, yeah. which then if you had such a model would let you predict the right camera yeah. and so on. But a different approach, a weaker goal would be to just say, well, the bottom line that I care about is what gamma do I find in the real world. Right. Any experiment that gives me good information about that yeah. is fun. Like for example, in the first half of the research, you just use this kind of machine learning algorithm to try and figure out what yeah. the signals were. Exactly. And it's not telling you cause and effect. Right. So I'm just curious, I mean, so which, which do you Which want? do I find? Okay, so I'm, I, so my, 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 I would love to have a model of how these subjects are behaving in the lab. I, I'd really dearly, I mean, that would be the killer model, because then I could predict what's going to happen next. I wouldn't have to run experiments. It's like I could design airplanes in the computer now. I wouldn't have to put them in a wind tunnel. This way. So aeronautical engineers finally figured a way to get fluid dynamics simple enough, or at least explained enough, that they actually could do it in computer. I'd love to be able to do that, to get rid of the lab, you know, and just get the model. I think that's hard to imagine accomplishing. So from an applied mechanism, so if, and if I had that, then I could do the mechanism design. If I, so that would be my first goal, but I don't believe that I'm going to see that uh, in my lifetime, but maybe it'll happen. Uh, but the, the, the next goal is the applied design, which is <laughs> let, let, me, let me just try, you know, let, give me some algorithms that I can try some things. So the, it's, a, it's a much more, uh, so, so. it's a much more adaptive approach. And the first approach is let's build, let's sort of traditional, let's build the model, let's sit around, get it right, get it right. Then I can go back and I can do the optimization and I'm done. The, the approach I think that will really work is this kind of approach where, where everybody's adaptive. The mechanism designer's adaptive, the system's adaptive, the technology's adaptive. I mean, we're, we're working the whole thing. I don't know whether that answers your question, but I, that's the one I think that's going to have the biggest payoff. So for example, and that's the one that requires computer scientists and economists to work together, by the way. So anytime you want to move down to Caltech, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was just thinking you were talking about you know speed of convergence right. around. Yeah. And in some sense it seems like that's irrelevant. And if you have the same curve okay. shape with respect to the gammas, well, you're getting kind of good information about yeah, the, I mean, the, the problem, right? Yeah, I mean the, the pinning down the speed of convergence was the reason you'd want to do it to get it right is that that was the point at which the efficiency, aggregate efficiency and across the process was highest because the, the sooner you get to the Nash equilibrium, the sooner you're at the optimal allocation. And right. so in some sense, the longer it takes you to get sort of zeroed in, the worse it is. But suppose in the, suppose in the simulation for all gammas, you were exactly 10 times as many rounds. Okay. Right. I mean, yeah. That's, uh, that's, well, fair. that's fair. So that's the shape fair. is the same. The yeah, same that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think... Yeah, I mean, ultimately, though, you, you might ask, I mean, sort of the, the next question would be, okay, I can get that gamma right, even though I don't know exactly what's going on. 
But maybe the Gros Ledger mechanism isn't the right mechanism. Maybe there's another mechanism which has a beta parameter which gets you a lot better than this Gros Ledger mechanism with this parameter gamma. And I mean, so, particularly when you look at so the, yeah, stable. Yeah, and so the issue is how do you how do we how do we think about revising, uh, adapting the mechanisms in, in a way rather than I mean right now we think these things up out of our head and we sometimes they work. I mean. Eric's always work. Mine I work about half the time, and you know, so you get these things working, and you know, it'd be it'd be easier to say, well, here's one that does so well. Now, if I tweak this term or I do this, or I ch where do I fix, do I change the pro? What happens if I change protocols in the middle? It's it's that's the kind of thing I think that and I don't think we know a lot about that, especially when you start throwing the networks in that you guys play with, which is even worse. Okay. Hey, I'm John. sorry. I'm talking. Oh, too that's much. fine. Thank you, John. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs>